Access to the internet has increasingly become a necessity more than a luxury. Now, more than ever, connecting with our loved ones is both a challenge and a necessity. Some of us found solace in connecting digitally, and for others, it's hard to imagine a world without Wi-Fi, phones, or the internet. But without Richard Thanke, many vulnerable populations would still not have access to the internet. In the summer of 2015, Richard volunteered at the Calais refugee camp in northern France. While there, he had a light bulb moment and realized there was a huge need for Wi-Fi connectivity, both for the refugees and the organizations working in the camp. Thanki and his co-founders established Jangala, a non-profit organization that connects vulnerable populations worldwide to affordable and accessible Wi-Fi. From its initial concept till today, almost seven years later, Jangala is a solution to digital access and equities. I'm Tariq al and this is People and Planet, a podcast from EXO 2020 Dubai's program for People and Planet, where changemakers from all over the world break down what it will take to create a sustainable future for our planet. During Travel and Connectivity Week at EXO 2020 Dubai, Thanki discussed the vital role Wi-Fi and other forms of connectivity provide to increase digital access to those who need it most. Richard, you're an economist and a computer scientist. And while you run a tech startup, it's centered around perhaps the most vital of technologies and tools that we have access to as a humanity, which is radical empathy, community, and collaboration. Richard Thanke is the co-founder of Jangala, a UK-based charity working to enable internet access for people in need of urgent humanitarian aid and longer-term development assistance. Welcome. It's a pleasure to connect with you today. It's a pleasure being here. I'd love to start from the beginning. Uh, Can you please tell me about your upbringing and how the environment around you inspired you to take this path uh, in life, both as a child and as a young teen growing up in the UK? I'm the child of refugees. So my parents were refugees from Uganda who left in the 1970s um, due to the kind of unrest that happened there. Less than eight weeks are left before the deadline runs out. Eight weeks in which, according to General Amin, 65,000 Asians must leave Uganda. So far, only a handful have gone. The rest spend day after day waiting in queue after queue. They queue for tickets, they queue for permits, they queue at ministries, they queue at the bank, but still, they can't get out. And they kind of came to the UK. And I didn't really understand what that was. I never felt like say, a refugee when I was growing up, or the child of ref- refugees. Um, I was born in the UK. Um, and there's always a feeling of being kind of slightly alien to a culture. Um, you know, I, you know, my parents were slightly fearful of the UK. You know, this was not where they'd grown up. Um, but, you know, they thought that it would be best for me and my sister to be here. But I never felt kind of, maybe as I was growing up, kind of wholly apart of the things that were around me. Um, and my parents never really told me stories of what happened to them and why they had to leave. I think they wanted to keep that kind of slightly traumatic part of their history, like, you know, away from me to protect, to protect me as a child, I think. And so I kind of grew up in a small, kind of small market town in England, with my only kind of links being kind of stories my mum would tell about growing up in Uganda, you know, on the banks of the River Nile, and being surrounded by rainforest where in the small kind of trading post of Pakwach where she grew up. So yeah, Wellingborough where I grew up was very different from that, like a small kind of former industrial town. And it was very, very interesting. There's a kind of stereotype people have of especially kind of Indian immigrants in, in the UK that they all want their kids to be doctors or lawyers or accountants or engineers. But um, you know, my dad was quite different from that. I mean, he always 
Um, you know, he never paid close attention to my grades, but just assumed that I would work hard. And I think he always just wanted me to create something new. And I always had that feeling from him. And that's what he would say. And you remember the first time you got access to the internet? Right. So I absolutely do. So um, my parents got me a big desktop PC that sounded like an aircraft carrier about to take off. Like a helicopter. And I remember turning it on and connecting via dial-up to the internet, you know, as a teenager. And being just kind of mesmerized by the... Uh, the kind of slight kind of music of those sounds. And I mean, it sounds a bit like techno and I love techno now, so I'm sure I was influenced by it in that way. Um, and what was in front of me was just complete magic. The idea that, you know, anyone in the world could kind of post to this medium and that anyone in the world could consume this medium. That kind of serendipity, that kind of richness of potential connectivity, you know, left an impression on me. And in Caring for the Commons, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Jangala's origin story. Uh, you're leading Jangala, a not-for-profit UK-based tech startup. It's dedicated to enabling internet access for people in need of connectivity, um, especially refugees, which is a topic close to your heart and your lived experience. What does Jangala mean to, to start off with? And why did you choose that name as a source of your inspiration? Like so many things we've done, it happened from kind of serendipity. We were building this volunteer-run Wi-Fi network in the Kali Jungle refugee camp, and I had to choose a name for it. And I was told a story by a woman called Maya, a French woman, who had been kind of helping refugees in that area. And she was the one who told me this, told us the story that the name of the Kali Jungle refugee camp, it wasn't called the jungle because outsiders or reporters or politicians called it that. But the very first people that were living on that site were Afghans. And in Pashto, like Jangal means like a barren piece of land. And I thought that's really similar to the English word jungle. So what's the root of this word? And doing a little bit of digging, found the stem of the, both those words is from Sanskrit, which is like a kind of ancient Indo-European language. And Jangala has two meanings. It means like a barren or stony place, but also it can mean a wild person that comes from that place. I loved the way the word looked. I loved its kind of unusual accents. I loved how it kind of came from a language that kind of connects everything from kind of Iceland all the way to Northern India. So you spoke about that you were doing that work in, uh, in the Kali jungle. Can you give us some context of the camp and the work that you were doing at that time as Jangala was getting set up? So Calais is a place in Northern France from which there is the Channel Tunnel that links uh, France to the UK and so for people who want to come to the UK overland that's the kind of place to go from now in 2015 the refugee crisis in Europe was kind of reaching its peak um, you know multiple crises all over the world from the collapse of Libya to the civil war in Syria to um, conflict in the Horn of Africa to terrorist activity militant activity happening in, in West Africa and the Sahel was causing a huge amount of instability. There were so many people on the move. Turning overseas, about 100 migrants are missing in the Mediterranean off Libya. Their boat capsized during the perilous journey from North Africa to a better life in Europe. More than 6,000 have been rescued since Monday, 40,000 this year. The Calais jungle refugee camp emerged not as a kind of Red Cross run camp, the kind of camps that people may be familiar with in other parts of the world. But it was an informal settlement, really, of people who were trying to get across to the UK. At its height, there were over 10,000 people living there, including kind of women and children. There was no real sanitation at all. There was no camp structure. My friend Ben Wetherill was talking about how his old school friend, Nils O'Hara, and his sister, Jazz, were working in the Kelly Jungle refugee camp. I thought that was great. And at this time, I was working in Africa with Microsoft. I was kind of working in Ghana, Namibia, kind of South Africa and Kenya until the thought came to Ben. Well, one of the things that Nils is always complaining about is that there's no good internet access in the Kelly jungle. That what will happen is that someone will ask to borrow his phone to make a phone call to Somalia. Now, a 30 second phone call to Somalia costs quite a lot of money. And Nils was like, I can't carry on doing this. We're sorry, your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please check the number and try again.
But when I kind of realized there was a need for Wi-Fi, like immediately I thought, okay, this is something I can help with. The projects that I've been working with in Africa have like taught me how to build networks. Some of the techniques that we're using there could easily be transferred to the jungle. And so when this idea hit me, it kind of was like a flash of lightning, really. I stayed up until four in the morning looking at satellite photos. But it, and like the former consultant I was, I put together a PDF with my credentials at the bottom, with a diagram of how we would do it, about how much it would cost. And I emailed it to Nils, like four in the morning. And things moved quickly. Within two weeks of that, Nils and myself were in the Calais jungle, you know, in late autumn, in like the rain and the mud, getting confused stares from the people in the camp saying, what are these two guys doing? You know, we crowdfunded um, the donations needed to build this network um, that Nils' kind of sister helped with. So at the time I was doing a PhD, I was working with Microsoft, and this was like a volunteer thing I was doing on the side. We went kind of every other weekend for a few weeks, and in late autumn, early winter, we were able to turn the Wi-Fi network on to kind of cover the camp. And the effect that it had was, was amazing. I mean, we didn't have to tell anyone about the existence of this. Like, word spread like wildfire. And suddenly there was this kind of strange moment where, like, there was a camp, and the camp that was normally noisy, there was a bit of silence. people were like engaging with their kind of online lives like send you know we asked people what they were doing they were sending messages to family and sending photos and catching up on things that were from you know everything from like news from their home country to how their favorite football team was doing and then people started sharing what they were doing with the people around them and it was kind of a striking feeling turning on the internet in a place where it's not been before and suddenly being reconnected allowed people to to kind of re-engage and, you know, people were kind of laughing and being emotionally engaged with what they were doing, as well as accessing information about asylum processes and so on. There was definitely like that kind of practical element as well, but also for the organizations working in the camp. So there must've been a hundred different volunteer organizations and with internet access, they were able to coordinate their work. They were able to provide better services for the people there they were able to reduce duplication and waste and all of those things. So, you know, it helped so many different aspects of life in that camp. I'm curious as you're speaking, when we're near in the camp and you're coming from your own lived experience of a family of refugees and you spoke about your parents almost shielding you uh, from maybe some of those stories, did it make you go back and reflect on, actually, I want to learn a little bit more about my parents' experience. I and did it did it bring up anything for you personally that then yeah spurred the vision in also different ways? Absolutely, yeah, one hundred percent. And I spoke to members of my family who'd also gone through the same experience. And I mean, one of the striking things was how the notion of a refugee had changed. That back when you know my family were put through this position, they were offered citizenship by the UK. You know, there was a kind of there was almost a kind of nobility to being kind of a refugee. Five years into the refugee and migrant crisis, the numbers of people fleeing to Europe are dropping due to the pandemic, except in one place. A record 6,000 plus asylum seekers crossed the English Channel to the United Kingdom this summer from the French port of Calais. From the port of Dover, special correspondent Malcolm Brabant reports. The protesters are furious that record numbers of asylum seekers are landing on these shores. These are invaders. You should be protecting us, not them. But, I mean, what happened in 2015 and still happens today is that refugees are demonised. That, you know, that you have people who want to kind of inflame passion and anger against people who, uh, you know, are often really desperate, fleeing from situations that, you know, kind of seem unimaginable. And that kind of difference in status was something that I, I recalled feeling quite strongly at the time. And it made me want to speak to my parents more about what their experience was like. And it made me really kind of understand the sympathy that I've always seen in my like, dad, for example, where, you know, he will always humanise every situation and every person 
because I think you know he himself had been that stranger, had been that person that was the object of curiosity, of you know maybe suspicion, and so a lot of things started kind of making sense to me that maybe yeah it provided me with a deeper understanding of where I had come from as well. And of course, one of Jangala's greatest achievements was the creation of the big box. Um, which uh, is a small device which provides a portable Wi-Fi connection and enables internet access for people in need. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about the big box, um, what it is, its other uses, uh, other maybe than the Kale camp, uh, and maybe for our listeners uh, as well to talk about like what goes in the box. The big box was kind of born of frustration, really. After we built the network, news of what we'd done had spread. So we were contacted by organizations from all over Europe, the Middle East, North Africa even, saying, well, we have this situation here where there is no internet access. So as volunteers, we did what we could. We traveled whenever we could. We spent a lot of time kind of going to the Greek islands or the mainland, going to other places in France. And it was in kind of 2016 that I thought, you know, can we find a way of of mass producing what we're doing And so I kind of sketched some ideas of what that would be. I spoke to uh, Nils and Samson, uh, Rinaldi. And um, Samson is, was also a volunteer in the Cali jungle. Like Sam is a trained sculptor and a fine artist. And so the three of us spent a few weekends thinking about this. And yeah, we put together the first prototype of Big Box. And at that point, it was big. And I still remember vividly the first time we used Big Box, we took it out to Greece to work in a kind of mobile library project. And um, yeah, I mean, it was quite funny. We almost managed to leave it at the airport. As the doors of the coat bus were closing, Samson saw that it was outside. He leapt out like a gazelle and picked it up and got it back inside. So people loved how easy it was to use. Still remember getting like WhatsApp messages from our partners on the ground saying, this is great. We're connecting like 100 people or... 200 people are using the system right now. I mean, just in the field of refugees, there are 80 million people who are displaced around the world. There's 200 million people around the world who need immediate humanitarian assistance. And there are over a billion people living in the least developed countries. And of those, 80% don't have access to the internet. And then, yeah, it was in 2018 that we went, became a full-time organization, that Jangala as as an entity was born. And I wanted to go a little bit into your thoughts on Expo 2020. Uh, you've been here for, uh, for for a little over a week now. Um, you've engaged uh, earlier in January. Uh, you held a talk at Expo's Closing the Digital Divide event, where you also showcased Jangala um, as a solution to digital access inequities. What are some of the takeaways uh, that you hope audiences listening to your talk took from it? I was immediately struck when we were asked to apply for the best global best practice program of Expo 2020. I immediately saw Expo's kind of motto, its kind of strap line of connecting minds and creating the future. And we can't stop and say, well, okay, there's 50%. That's pretty good. We can't stop at 80% and say, well, look, we've almost solved the problem. That's still not good enough. And I would say that like the provision of connectivity in a kind of open source transparent way is something that empowers other infrastructures on top that you know we will work with partners you know we don't have the whole solution ourselves but our goal at Jangala is to create the underlying infrastructures that other people can use to build their own public goods on top of and i think that's really important for us um no brilliant thank you um, we will not be the complete answer there is no one organization that will be but we want to be part of that answer an important part of that answer and You know, for us to come, to be able to come from a volunteer project, which was, you know, a couple of people (laughs) working in their spare time in the rain and the wind of the coast of northern France, to being given this opportunity to have much bigger impact. On a closing note, where do you see the future of connectivity and digital access moving forward? I think something that always rings true in this kind of situation is that, you know, the future... Future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And I think we can all see examples of that. Like when we saw the Calais jungle in northern France, this informal refugee camp, to some eyes it must have looked like the past, like a kind of Victorian or medieval setting. And I would say that 
The internet of today is in danger of becoming brittle. We depend increasingly on a small number of companies, as you said, these conglomerates, that control large parts of our internet infrastructure. So I think, for me, our digital wealth in the future will come from communities being able to build their own infrastructure, to build the cloud in miniature in their own communities, to be able to deploy applications and things from the household to the community level to the national level, region, cities. And I think that that is going to become possible. And, you know, in terms of the future that we see for Jangala, our goal is to equip communities with the ability to deploy the internet on their own terms, to be able to make use of it in a way that works for them and to allow people to innovate with it as well. I think, again, another one of the dangers that we face is that, you know, the internet becomes remote for people. The people don't have the experience of building it and putting it together themselves. And now in Jangala, we're lucky we've had this experience. But you know, many people won't, and it would be great. It would be a great achievement of ours if we could inspire a new generation of people to you know, roll up their sleeves, get their hands dirty, and build the infrastructure that they need. Thank you, Richard. It's been incredibly inspiring speaking to you, uh, and it's been a, a real honor to, to connect today. Thanks, Tariq. People and Planet is an official podcast of Exo 2020 Dubai, creating a sustainable future for our planet together. Learn more by visiting virtualexpodubai.com or searching Program for People and Planet. People and Planet is produced by Kerning Cultures Network. Episodes are released every second Monday. Hit subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss an episode. And if you enjoyed the show, share it with your friends and leave us a review.